Praise the Lord. Dusty rode his horse today. Last week, you just had to lay him in the back of the pickup to get him to town. Now he's riding his horse. Praise Jesus. Anybody else got a praise report? Anything good happening? We had one a couple weeks ago, didn't we, Gene? Dang right. How many of y'all believe praying works? Amen. Only if God can hear you. How many know that God can hear you? If you're born again, God can hear you. If you're not born again, you need to get that away so God can hear you. The best way to know you're born again is because you can hear Him. That's good. Anybody been hearing from God lately? That's it gets quiet. How about y'all preach tonight to me? Let's do that. If anybody's been hearing from God, y'all preach to me tonight. We'll just do that. <laughs> All right, we're on there. So we're glad to have everybody. Everybody's on the Internet and everybody's joining us tonight. Uh, my coffee with the Colonel that I started this morning in the dark. Uh, it was almost dark before I got it on the Internet tonight. It finally finally went on about, I don't know, about 4 o'clock or 4.30 or something and and we had a busy day today at Selborne, so I didn't have time to monkey with it and terrorize them people. And sometimes I have to terrorize Facebook quite a bit until they finally just allow me on the, the, the super highway or whatever that is. So anyhow, we got on there. But if you watch that a little bit, you know that when I want to talk about some things tonight, kingdom-wise, some things that we've already been talking about. How many of you were here Tuesday morning? Or tuned in for Ezekiel 39 Tuesday morning. First 10 verses were very relevant uh, about the kingdom of God, how God handles his enemies. See, the enemies of God's people are the enemies of God. People who are enemies of the way that God set things up to be. There's a lot of this that you don't have to be a Bible student to even figure out. The laws of God, God's nature are naturally the laws of nature's God. So that's simple. He says, look to the created things. You want to see the invisible attributes of God? Look to the, the created things, what was made. That's Romans chapter 1. And so in that, you have a lot of people that, that are against everything that's right. Have y'all noticed anything lately? We talk about it a lot around here. Anything to you guys seem a little upside down? Everything. Pretty close, isn't it? Yeah. I'm telling you, every time I go to town, I feel like a guy that's been in jail for 50 years and just got out and going, what the, what the heck happened while I was gone? Uh, I mean, there's some of the dumbest stuff, and... And 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 it's normal for people. I mean, I'm the I'm the weirdo. Everything's normal, and you're going that can be normal. That's really stupid. <laughs> How can that be normal? So everything's upside down. But God's church, His people, not a building, not an organization. It'll be right side up. Always. Cannot be any other way. The kingdom of God will always, always be right side up. And so I want to, tonight, and uh, no telling how many nights, that we're going to continue to encourage each other in this. Every day that we draw closer to the coming of the Lord, things have to be upside down. We're going to read tonight that he says, our God is a consuming fire. Well, what's that mean? Anybody know what that means? It means that he's a consuming fire. He consumes everything that's not of him. Eventually, one way or the other, either now, during, forward, at the end, just read the book. He's a consuming fire. The unholy things. The things that are not of him. So as we've taught about the institutions, the seven institutions in the land that we've become very dependent on will eventually be removed. But the one 
institution, the kingdom of God, it'll always stand. It's not going anywhere. I think that's been some pretty ill teaching that said in the midst of everything that God's going to consume, everything he hates, everything he's sick of, you just sit here until we get you out of here. Matthew 13 does not verify that. It contradicts it. Matthew 24 contradicts it. When you leapfrog Scripture over the New Testament so that you can create some type of futuristic theology of some kind, everybody be pretty careful about all that. Because right now today we're here. How many of y'all are somewhere else? You're here. Yes. And our God is here. And we're his people, and we should be revealing his glory. So we're going to talk about all that tonight, and I want to talk about three financial principles tonight and and explain myself a little bit. I've kind of made a joke, a little bit of a joke, and and I've got, I got to learn to clarify a little bit that, you know, you better not do any vague joking around because <clears> – but and it's really not a joke, but it was just – just kind of a neat little old funny thing, but there's a truth to the principle of it. But I've said several times here in the last little bit that the kingdom of God stands right side up and everything outside the kingdom gets turned upside down. What happens when all the enemies of God get turned upside down? The change falls out of their pockets. A Christian should be standing open-handed. Well, I'm going to teach on open-handedness a little bit tonight, what that really means. It's not so you can sit around and catch money coming from the ones that Jesus has turned upside down. Yet the Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that we need sheep and goats to survive. I can prove it. I'm in the horse sale business. If you'll just let me operate amongst church people, I will starve to death. Tightest group of people on the planet. Goats? They'll spend her like crazy, baby. Bring me some goats. I can sell some goats, some horses, and we'll do really good. But you do. We live amongst you. Gotta, so it's where your dependency lies where your thought process is, where your source is, who's your source, not what you know, but who you know, what's in you, who are you. And as you talk about all these things and we proceed forward, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters. We have, we have a, a responsibility. I'm not neglecting any of that. But the further we go and we watch the backwardness of our systems, and we watch the takeover of the Babylonian system and our dependency on those systems. I mean, God told me several months ago when I told y'all, he said, it's time to preach to my people. That's what this is about. This I heard it really good this week, a, a deal I read and shared it with a couple of y'all. But, you know, how will you say that the church is a hospital for the unsaved? That is a lie. There are no unsaved in the church. <gasps> How dare you? There is no unsaved in the church. The church is living stones. The church is not a building. The church is not an organization. The church is living stones. Those indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that's the church. If you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you're not unsaved. You want to be part of the church, you got to get born again. So that doesn't mean a membership role with a pledge card. I mean, it's just born again. That's it. And God said, told me, he said, speak to my people. We got to become aware of this kingdom we live in. We got to become aware of the atmosphere of the kingdom of God. We got to be aware of the supremacy of God's government so we can live in his economy. That crazy system that's out here upside down, that boat won't float forever now. It, it's, it's floating along pretty good now, but you got to shoot a lot of money underneath of it from somewhere to keep it floating. That's all coming from somewhere. 
But those of us who live according to kingdom principles, we're fine. And we'll live in an atmosphere of love, peace, and joy. We'll learn principles about ourselves, principles about family living. We can learn principles about finance and work and different things. We can learn awareness about dependency in Babylonian institutions. See, we got to separate from those things. You can be party to them. You just can't be dependent on them. They can't replace God. That's that's the whole key. So we'll talk about some more of this stuff. And tonight, we're just going to have a good, quaint little old meeting right here right quick. We've got some things to talk about, things to show you in the Bible right quick, and then we'll get the heck out of here, and y'all can go home and fix anything that needs fixed when you get there. <laughs> okay? Take notes tonight so you don't have to call me. Just go home and fix, fix your mess. <laughs> That's, that's what we did last week after Bunk left. Holy moly. I told Bunk, I said, you ain't coming back. My God, I was forgiving people I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, for, I forgive you for making me wanting to say words to you while you cut me off on the highway. <laughs> yeah, all right, let's pray right quick. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for your word tonight. Thank you for this gathering tonight, Lord, this family of believers. We just come together tonight to learn so that we can be separate. That we, as though we're in this world, Lord, but we're not of it. And Lord, we operate in worldly things. We operate in life and jobs and family and kids and all the stuff that comes with that. But you said, Lord, in your word that you created all this for our enjoyment. And so, Lord, from inside the kingdom, this life is pretty enjoyable. And I just want to thank you for the things you reveal. Because revelation only comes by your Holy Spirit, Lord, and I thank you for that. So we bless you tonight, Lord. Forgive us where we fail. Forgive me where I fail. Help us all to do better by you, God. Be revealers of your glory. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey, a couple little announcements right quick. We're going to... We're going to pray after a while for some folks. I've got a little little guy named Brady Martin, 10 years old. Kind of get him on your mind. I got messaged about him. He's got a form of leukemia, needs some help. But if you're around this week and you want to help out too, food pantry is going to be in full operation Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning if you want to go over there and help out. And if you want to play a bigger part, uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, they're going to have work night over there. So uh, if you want to be in on some of that, you can go help at the food pantry. I'll tell you, it's a pretty neat deal. Uh, Robin and I finally was home on a Saturday when that happened the last time, and and uh, I don't know what she did on the inside. They did a lot on the inside, but I'm gonna tell you, we we did we did really good out in the parking lot. And that's me and a couple other guys. We were the parking lot guys, and I'm tell you, we we made it happen. So if you, I, I'd encourage you to volunteer for the parking lot. <laughs> You can do a lot of jacking around in the parking lot. Nobody knows it. But uh, but it is good. It's a really good deal. Uh, if you got your Bibles with you tonight, surely to goodness you will have a Bible. If you don't, we'd love to give you one. Um, go to Haggai. And I want to read you something out of Haggai tonight. Haggai's right over there just, just before you get to Malachi. One of the things we talk about while you're turning to Haggai, one of the things we talk about a lot as we've been teaching in our Tuesday mornings as we go through the Old Testament. I just love the Old Testament because you see God who delivered his people Israel, how he maintained a position with them from going from being a cloud by day and a light by night to placing his spirit in and upon prophets, either major or minor, how they spoke to Israel, how they spoke to the enemies of Israel, how Israel responded to those prophetic words, the direction of God, whether negatively, positively, how they chose leadership, how they formed idols, 
how they fell into all the modern-day traps of humanism and how God reacted and how God responded. And so when you go back and look at that and you, well, that's just Old Testament. We're under grace now. Grace never did. Was, grace is not a substitute for stupid. Okay? That's just grace. Grace didn't. All grace did was give you a chance to get your ducks in a group when you can't get them in a row. That's what grace did. But the truth of the matter is, he said, I'm an unchanging God. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus brought us into covenant. God desired covenant with his people from the Passover on. He desired covenant. He required a sign. And he, he required obedience. So there's a lot to be gleaned and a lot to be learned by man's historical relationship with the God who's always been. And when we as the church, his people, begin to see that we make the same, we make the same mistakes as God's children have done from the beginning and how God operates in that. And how we've been given an opportunity to repent, how we're given an opportunity to change, and how we can work in harmony with God. So you know, when you go to a minor prophet like Haggai, and he prophesies and he gives word, and you realize how relevant this word is today. When the Bible says the word of God is live and active, it's living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, Dividing bone, marrow, soul, and spirit. Still talking about this word. I want you to tell me today, all of you that was raised up in the New Testament church, which part of this book is not God breathed? The parts that y'all decide to leave out on Sunday morning? The parts you won't write about in your little study books anymore? Why would you have a study book in a Sunday school class? You have a book. Read this one. It's a really good study book. If you'll study this book, you'll know everything that's in them other books except the part that man writes. All the God stuff, you'll know it already. So we just do this one. And so, hey, God, right here in, in chapter 6, verse 1, We've been talking about sowing and reaping and finances and different things now for, for a while. Hey, got chapter 1, verse 6. What did I say, chapter 6, verse 1? I did that yesterday, too. I said we're going to do the first 10 chapters of Ezekiel. The first 10 chapters of Ezekiel 39. We're going to do verse, starting verse 6 of chapter 1 of Haggai. If you have six chapters in your Bible of Haggai, <laughs> let me sell you a different Bible. It says you have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. I want to stop right there for just a minute. I've said it around here 20 times in the last year. I do not believe that God will teach you how to get rich. But I believe that God will teach you how to sew up, sew up the holes in your purse. I wonder if ever a hole in our purse would look like the institution of education. They tried that on me one time. I didn't fall for it. They said, I need to save up for college. I told them I'd already been. Nobody saved up for mine. I did it the old-fashioned way. I got me a J-O-B. While I was at my J-O-B, I carried 16 to 18 hours. Oh, yeah, I had to squeeze four years into five, but that's because I changed majors 12 times. Oh, yeah, the last two years of all that, we paid for our own little bitty, 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 bitty apartment. 
and we paid our own bills and we bought our own gasoline. Oh, and believe me, that was the first gas price hike back there about 1979. I'll never forget when snuff went to a dollar a can and gas went to a dollar a gallon. And I told Robin, I said, we ain't never going to make it. We're never going to make it. My pickup got six miles a gallon. We just ain't never going to make it. So uh, there's a lot of times the need for education. If you invest in an education, yet you reap no reward. You see, the reward of an education would be a J-O-B. So if you invested in an education, they shouldn't be 26 living in your basement. They should be working. The Bible talks a lot about work. It's necessary to make a living. You have to work to make a living. How many of us have become dependent on the idea of a higher education because you can't survive without one. Ain't nobody got guts enough to stand up here and say this, but I'm going to tell you, there's as many dummies walk the aisle every May as there is walking the street. Yeah. The one class they do not teach in higher education is Mucho Trabajo 101. No, if you got a purpose in it, if you got a purpose in it, you got to learn something. I'm just sick of the idea that if if you decide to take a different route, you're shameful. We brought our kids up in a town like that, in a town that had a college. So when we were at a third grade class meeting one time, I was the oddball in the room because I just did not feel like planning my child's future in the third grade. No. Why don't you just do reading, writing, and arithmetic and do the old-fashioned kind where you use the alphabet and 2 plus 2 still equals 4. I do not understand what they do in higher education where you're trying to figure out a way to make 2 plus 2 not equal 4 anymore. You're an idiot. It will always equal 4. <laughs> it always will. You can't change it. I'm not downsizing higher education with a purpose, but I'm just telling you what institutions have done to create dependency. And we're living proof at our house. I picked mine up after four days. Pray God she didn't stay any longer and I could get my money back. Yeah. She didn't turn into the village idiot either. She drives our congressman around all over the state. Nobody else gets to talk to him. She does. I went so I could learn what to do after work. That's what I did at college. I learned what to do after work. <laughs> so, well, I know y'all are giggling, but we just went to church and had Bible studies. <laughs> That's what we did. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, in all this, we got a job and went and did my thing. Here again, I'm not, I'm not belittling purpose when there's purpose. Without purpose, it becomes a whole. Because you don't know what you're investing for. If you don't invest with a purpose, how do you expect to return? What do you invest in without purpose? Murph, how many cows do you buy that you don't plan on them having a calf or doing something? You invest with a purpose, don't you? That's kingdom principle. You invest when it comes to money. It's an investment. You, can't, you heard me the other day. You cannot sow money because it's not a seed. You invest money because you expect a return. You invest in your business, you invest in your education, you invest. But if you invest without purpose, you're likely to have a hole. Institution of entertainment. How big of a hole is that in our purse? How much money spent entertaining ourselves? It's easy. We're addicted to it. How many of us are trained in entertainment? I'm a guilty. Cowboy Channel. <laughs> I've watched every rodeo there is. It's entertainment. What is the profitability of entertainment? It's not ticket sales. 
football game, baseball game, wrestling match, boxing match, rodeo. What's what's the what's the gift that keeps on giving? Nine dollar beer. <laughs> Nine dollar beer. That's why you see a Budweiser or a Coors sign on every football field, every baseball field, on half the trophy saddles or something. That's where the money comes from. Why? Because we're investors. You cannot invest in entertainment and expect a return except to please your flesh. Now, where did that leak into our lives? It's what we do here. We're in the entertainment business. Well, I go there to learn, really. Tell me three syllables I told you last week. And this is a really good place. And you're all really good people. Come on, don't shout me down. Leonard? There you go. There's a guy. Hey, I did too. I got up here and had confession. I was the first guy to have confession last week. <laughs> but yeah. How big of a deal is entertainment in Christianity nowadays? It's huge. You got to get the timing right. You got to get the lights right. You got to get the music right. You got to get the messaging right. If if we get a bigger crowd with a guy that preaches with his shirt tail out, next week everybody will have their shirt tail out. Just pick a spot. Whatever attracts people because we're like bass, if it glitters, we'll jump at it. If it doesn't look attractive, we'll just stay in the rocks. <laughs> and so, isn't that the truth? So he says right here, he said, you sow, but you have little. You want, you're hungry, and you don't have enough to eat. You're thirsty, and you don't have enough to drink. Why? Because we've got the kingdom mechanism all messed up. You were told you could sow into a ministry and it'd be given back to you, pressed down, shaking together, and overflowing. And that's a lie because you can't sow money. Money's not a seed. I told you last week, four seeds. One comes out of a man, one comes out of a woman, one comes out of the ground, another comes out of the word. That's it. If you don't sow, you got to have a seed. If you don't have a seed, you're not going to get a crop. If you're going to invest, invest with a purpose, planning on a return. And the institutions have learned. The institution of religion has entertained you and then told you to sow. Told you that your sowing was generosity and that what we were doing was pleasing to God Yet, small-town America, your everyday little church is barely meeting their annual budget. Attendance is down. Money's down. Everything's down. You got some of the mega things going on because the entertainment level has escalated. And so, that being said, we'll get more people. You get more people. You get more pockets. You get more pockets. You get, you know, the, you know the drill. So we got to be careful about our dependency on the institution. Can, can your faith survive if you never came to town again? You will never hear a preacher ask you that. Why? They want you here. I want you here in hopes that you can learn something. or We can learn something together and we can all go home and be better. We're not going to come in here and go home and be better. There's no need in coming here. This isn't what pleases God. This is what gets us ready to leave here and please God. Be here, leave, and, and reveal His glory. We'll talk about that some more. So what about the part about your hands being upside right like this, open-handed? Because I got question on that a little bit Well. You can't just stand around wanting money. That's not what that's about. It's the principle of giving. Open-handedness as a Christian is generosity. How do you live open-handedly when everything's upside down? 
if Wall Street is going down every day, how do you live generous? It's easy if you don't trust the institution of finance. But if you got all your eggs in their basket, just know this. There's somebody walking around with a hammer that's going to bust some of your eggs. Get ready. That institution is not for your benefit. That institution, Wall Street and all that stuff, no different than the cattle business and the commodity business where people can own your cattle that don't even know which end the poop comes out. That's the craziest thing I've ever seen. But you know how they did that? Same way with Las Vegas did it. Y'all don't even know what that means. You've never been to a crap table, have you? Well, I saw it on TV once. <laughs> yeah, and that little Wheel of Fortune thing, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just know this. I know a straight meat to flush. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same thing. I mean, we're just having a good visit here tonight. Same same principle. <sighs> Hand it off to somebody else. Make sure they're going to take care of you. What day, what day did somebody convince everybody that the 401k was necessary? It wasn't long after they convinced you that at 65 years old, you need to get ready to die because you're no good anymore. If you live a longer life, Walmart greeters is the best you can hope for. If you're fairly athletic, we'll let you get the shopping carts. <laughs> Listen to this mentality. Where's that come from? It didn't come from this. Yet we've got, we've got people in our lives that spent a whole lifetime working with their hands, doing things, trusting Social Security. I've believed that Social Security would go away since I was 20 years old. My dad would tell me that. Do not trust that. It's going away. Do not trust that. It's going away. It hasn't gone away yet, but you got to know there are some other people's fingerprints on your money. And just so you know, in case you don't know, all the money that gets paid out in Social Security through the institution of government was put in there by working people. Not the other kind. Working people pay for all that. These are all institutional principles. So then you take a guy, you got to turn him out to pasture at 65. He had lived with holes in his pockets because nobody told him any different. Now he's totally subject to Social Security. And he barely has enough to eat. He barely has enough to drink. And get the privilege of new clothes. Been going to church. He's been visiting the institution forever. He's been putting in what he thought was doing his best. He was told that that was this when it's really this. And that minimized life without purpose, without provision, yet still striving to hold on to his faith. Why would I talk about such a thing? Because I'm 62. And I don't preach for a living. My faith was never a career move. My faith was a move into the kingdom. A learning of how to do this. In the next three years, my Social Security could, whew, believe me, you can call my accountant and we've been putting in. I'm just not going to trust it. But I don't know how to get rich. So I'm going to have to sew up some holes. And I'm going to have to live by kingdom purpose. What did I tell you at Gonzales after we had drove down to the junior high finals after Diesel went? 
cost me $47 an hour to drive my truck, pulling my horse trailer. The whole talk on the street is diesel's high. My alfalfa's going to $15 a bale. My head count of horses at my house has doubled. What did I tell you while we were there? Remember? I tell you a lot. Well, you're supposed to remember all of it, honey. You're going to have to start writing this stuff down. No, but I told her because we had been led by the Lord to do a little something. And I told her, I said, honey, I just do not believe today's the day that you become closed-fisted. Live like this. Live like this. Be generous. Invest with a purpose. Sew up the holes. Entertainment. A few other things. Sew up the holes. And be prepared. Because contrary to some people's belief, there's nothing in my refrigerator didn't go in there by the hands of man. There's not been one day that I walked in the freezer and there was half a beef in there that I didn't know where it came from. No, we bought it, killed it, packaged it, and stuffed it in there. How do we do it? Had to write a check. <laughs> How do we have enough money to write a check? Had a J-O-B. It wasn't by taking up an offering, a love offering, a love offering, because I love you so much that I'll preach to you if you'll love me back. Most of the time the way I preach, it's all you can do to like me. Yet, it says we don't have anything. Listen to the rest of this. Then he goes on down here to verse 11, and he said, I called for a drought on the land and the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine, the oil and whatever the ground brings forth on men, livestock, and all the labor of their hands. He's calling for, for judgment by the weather conditions, judgment in his creation. When are we going to come back to that? I remember one time when, when one of them big floods hit down there around New Orleans or something, and no, what's his name? What was his name on 700 Club? Uh, Pat Robertson. Yeah, he had the audacity to come on the TV and say, you know what, I believe we might all pay attention. That might be some of God's judgment on some of that erratic behavior that goes on down around there and some of the way y'all do your voodoo dolls and all your stuff. And I'm telling you, they like tore his head smooth off. You know what? I believe he might have been right. Yeah. If we really believe that in the midst of the drought that we're in again, maybe we would sow for a harvest of righteousness instead of just standing around pleading for rain. Maybe instead of running for governor of New Mexico on the whole pretense that you can be a cloud seed sower, like me, governor, I can make it rain. Shoot, you better pray like crazy. You can even get elected. That'll be a big enough trick. And if you do, you ain't going to have time to be flying around up there making it rain. Maybe a harvest of righteousness would make it rain. Oh, wouldn't that be kind of a cool idea? When's the last time we sowed for that? That's what we're doing here. You sow the word for that. Then he goes on down here to chapter, chapter 2. In the seventh month, 21st day of the month, word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of uh, Shil the Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest and the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? I'm going to stop right there for just a minute. How many of y'all still waiting for the glory of God to fall on your meeting? It gets quiet. The former and the latter. The Bible talks about it in the form of rain. 
the former and the latter. You realize you're in the latter? Who can remember the former? Would the glory of the latter not exceed the glory of the former? In this temple? How many people get together in a pile waiting on the glory of God to fall? If the glory is in the temple, where's that at? For you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the dwelling place of God. Corporately, we create an atmosphere, whether it's at home or in a group here. The presence of the Holy Spirit changes the atmosphere no matter where you go. I quote it all the time, 1 Peter chapter 2, you, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. When's the last time you looked at the mirror while you were brushing your teeth in the morning and you saw the glory of God in the temple? You don't even have to put your glasses on to see that. It's a really good question. While we keep getting in a pile every week, trying to get a whiff of God, I was telling a person this morning on the telephone we were talking about all this, and I said, you know, one of my favorite times this morning, this morning I got up real early, and I sat down with my Bible and was looking over some of this, and God told me, he said, get up and go outside. It was pitch dark. I didn't turn any lights on. And I had a little worship music going, and, and I just sat there with a cup of coffee and didn't say anything, didn't hear anything. Just sat there and here in a minute, and I'm weep, weeping, just overwhelmed by the presence of God. Later on, I was cleaning stalls. Maybe everybody needs a little horse poop and a fork. You know what happens when I'm cleaning stalls? You don't have to tell me to go clean stalls, do you, honey? It ain't because I like shoveling horse poop. God and I actually have conversations. While I'm picking stalls, I'll start talking to him. Here in a minute, I start hearing him. I think he likes work. I actually think he likes walking around with a guy doing work as opposed to a guy just sitting here waiting on something to happen. And we just converse. You know what the good news is? My horses poop a lot every day. There's a real good chance that me and God are going to get to talk every day. The temple in its former glory and the temple now. How do you see it? That's the question I want to ask tonight. How do you see the glory of God? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Does the glory of God in our religious community today look like nothing? Be serious. Is there a chance that to Everybody around, it looks like nothing. If we're supposed to be a hospital for sinners, then we got to go outside and look like somebody just dialed 911. We got to get out of here and let the whole world see the glory of God in the temple. Sunday morning, a friend of mine who's been tapping into a lot of stuff, him and I are going to go to a, a roping together here pretty soon. And so he, and this is going to really mess some of you religious people up. So he called me, and, and I was, we was talking, and I said, hey, you think we want to practice just a little bit together? This guy's really good, and I'm not that great, and I kind of wanted to give him a way out. Come down here and see what I don't have, and then you can back out. 
So he came down, and he, but he called me at the time, and he said, don't y'all do something on Sunday morning? I says, yes, we do. I said, there's a guy who teaches the Bible study every Sunday morning. Some Sundays I'm there, most Sundays I'm not. Everybody who wants to be there will be there, and those not there won't be there. We're good. I said, you want to come down Sunday morning? Let me tell you something. He came down Sunday morning, and we, we roped a little, and we hung out together. We prayed together. We cried together. We broke bread together. We talked about God for six solid hours. When he got ready to go home, I said, how was church? He said, best I ever been to. We were riding down the arena. And he said, I just can feel the presence of God. Now, Dad Gummit, when you put all your trust in the institution, you come totally dependent, that your Christianity is totally dependent on being somewhere at a certain time. Buddy, I'm going to tell you right now, your boat's got a hole in it, you're going to sink. That's just how it is. And he said, how do you see it? And he tells them to be strong, Joshua, and then be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. That's in verse 4. Be strong and work. We can just stop right there. Be strong and work. And he said, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. The church is the group of people whose spirit, whose God's spirit remains among. Only by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are you marked as God's. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This world is being turned upside down, yet I stand in a kingdom that is right side up. I'm going to get up every day and I'm going to go to work. I'm going to be me. That person I was on the phone with this morning said, you know what I love about your stories? It's just you being you. Just be you to the glory of God. Just live to the glory of God. Stand upright while everything else is going upside down. And while you get frustrated and you get confused and you want to talk about it, then blah, blah, blah. Be sure you're a generous. Be sure you're investing with a purpose. Be sure that you sow seed. Don't sow things that are not seed because you won't get a harvest. Be sure what you're sowing for and what you plan on reaping. Use these kingdom principles and you won't be without. You'll do good. And do not fear. What did they show us to, did in 2020? That you Christians are a bunch of chickens. Yeah. You guys are a bunch of chickens. I'm going to make all of you afraid. Hey, me not being afraid of something doesn't make it not real. Being afraid doesn't make you, or being fearless doesn't make you a pretender. You know, there's plenty of them out there too that, that you know, call these things that are as though they are not and this and that and other. You know, that's, remember me telling you one night in here, one of the problems with the church is y'all ain't been in enough bar fights. First, a big fat guy standing over here, been drinking all night, says, I'm going to kick your hand in. Get ready. <laughs> Oh, you're not here. <laughs> you don't mean it. <laughs> In the name of Jesus, you're lying. <laughs> no, he's fixing to tear your head off. <laughs> you just as well get ready. I don't care if you're talking about sickness, disease. I don't pretend it's not here. Here's what courage is. Courage is, is the things that make you afraid. You go towards them anyhow. It's not that things don't make you afraid or, or make you ca uh, aware, but you go anyhow. Firemen run into burning buildings. People, the sheriff, in situations all the time. We're not afraid. I'm not afraid of what people tell me might get me. 
it might get me. I'm not immune, but I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of that herd of imbeciles that's running our country. I'm no longer afraid if this country doesn't make it another five years. You can't talk like that. Really? Who do you think is going to clean the swamp now? Oh, yeah. Give me a good idea of somebody to pay off $33 trillion in debt without China owning the Grand Canyon. Yeah. So even if this all goes, I'm not afraid. Are you afraid? He said, don't be afraid. I'm learning how to do kingdom stuff. My government's up here. My economy's right under that. The atmosphere is love, joy, and peace. So he says right here, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, and it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I'll shake the nations. And they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. The gold is mine, the silver is mine. I'm the giver of the peace, and I'm going to reveal my glory. He told him, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I'm going to raise it up. Are you the glory of God today? Are you living proof that there's a kingdom that exists right now, and there's a king that you can approach the throne room of grace and talk to while you scoop and poop? everybody know that it's important Romans 8 tells us that we are adopted children therefore we are co-heirs let me give you one more kingdom principle we'll turn to Hebrews 12 and I'll be done when I come into the kingdom of God it is by total surrender so everything that's mine is now his I do not have to prove that by selling everything I have and giving it to an institution and living like a poor idiot the rest of my life. I do not need the institution to tell me what to do with my finances or my resources. I hear the voice of God. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, therefore are the sons of God. So if I've come into the kingdom because I've surrendered all to the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what happens next? It all becomes mine. I am now a co-heir with Christ is what Romans 8 says. If I'm a co-heir, if you wrote it on a piece of paper today, Gary Crandall, and you said, look, I love you, brother, so I want me and you to be equals. Everything I got on my deal, I'm going to put you down on the paperwork. You can sign my checks. You can, what's that mean? I got free access to everything, don't I? Therefore, I'm responsible for it. If I poop it off, and I pooped it off. So now everything that's his is mine, and everything's mine his. How in the world do you not survive that? If healing and power, vision, revelation, prayers, I don't even know how to pray. All these things are mine. I can hear the voice of God right straight from Isaiah 30. Whether you turn to the left or you turn to the right, walk this way. That I can know when I get up in the morning, Psalms 37, 4, that if I'll delight myself in the Lord by giving myself over to him is what that means. He will give me the desires of my heart. That's called living life to the full. That's how you do it. In the kingdom. Hebrews 12. Hebrews. Verse 12. Chapter 25. Y'all didn't even catch that. Let's, let's do. Let's do 12. 14. Or no. Let's do 12. 22. Because here's. Here's how you get. Here's the kingdom. 
But you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God. Aren't you going to go? What'd they do to you since you was a little kid? They told you you were going to go. You're going to live like a mere human until six guys drop you in a hole, and then if your name's in the book, you get to go. Right here it says, you have come. What do you mean I've come? I've come to a kingdom that's here, a kingdom that's now, a kingdom upon us, a kingdom at hand, a kingdom within us. I came through the gate, and the Bible says in John 10 that Jesus is the gate. He said, you've come to the city on the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. How many of y'all have driven through a town and somebody stole this scripture and put it on a sign? How many of y'all have seen the church of the firstborn? Let me tell you who that is. That's those who have been born again. Because of the firstborn, we were born again. If you're born again, you're of the church of the firstborn. <laughs> You don't know, here's your sign. I got a sign for you. It's the sign of the Holy Ghost. And he says, uh, who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of the sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel, the blood of Jesus. You have come to Mount Zion. How'd you get there? The Bible says in the Psalms that who may ascend to my holy hill? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. How's that work for a horse sale auctioneer? By faith. My sin, my sin and my obedience dictate how God works in harmony with me, whether it's by discipline or by blessing. But my sin does not diminish my faith. How many of you have sinned and yet still believe? Let's just be real honest because the institution will tell you the minute you fall, you Failed in your faith. No, sir. You believe this or don't believe it, but 20 years of preaching in here, been a day or two I sinned right before I preached. Anybody believe that? You see, if your sin disqualifies you, y'all been wasting your time for 20 years. I'm normal, yet very abnormal. It's by faith that we do this. And that blood taking care of it. And in verse 25, and then we're going to finish up. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. Do not refuse him who speaks. Here's the problem. The institution has been trying to train the flesh how to act like a Christian since the beginning of time, telling you what to do, where to be, where to sit, how much to give, what time to show up, and what time to go home. Let me tell you, there's a spirit of God who's alive and well, and he's here today. He dwells within me. He'll walk along with you while you're scooping poop. He'll speak into your ear, either left with the right or both at the same time when you're sinning in the presence of god he might meet you face to face on your back porch and tell you to get on your knees and repent but his voice is alive and well he said in john 10 that i'm the good shepherd my sheep know my voice they hear me and they follow me until the church of the living god starts listening to the voice of the living god i'm telling you you'll be dependent on the institution until jesus comes back and that consuming fire will destroy the whole thing be sure you're not in on it that's the truth. He said, See that you don't refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on the earth, how much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the, air, the earth, but now he is promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of, of those things that are being shaken. Listen to that now. The removal of the things that are shakable. 
as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yet we've been told this whole pile down here is a mess and we're just going to beam me up, Scotty. Just sit there. Be sure, you're, be sure you're good with the institution that can tell you you're good with God. So you're ready to go. Get your bags packed and be ready to go. But there's a shaking coming that's going to consume everything that's not of God. Everything is shakable. But what happens to the rest of it? The things that cannot be shaken may remain. I mean, go read Matthew 13. Master, should we get the weeds out of the wheat? No. Leave it alone. I'll be by. I'll get the weeds. And I'll put them in the fire while the wheat stays. Here's the one I love. Matthew 24. As in the days of Noah. Tell me what really happened in the days of Noah. Well, Noah escaped. Really, where'd he go? <laughs> he stayed here. Everything else was wiped off by flood. Noah stayed here. Why? So he could multiply and subdue. Why? So he could bring glory to God in the earth. Why? So he could promote righteousness through his offspring that would eventually come down through the lineage of Jesus, the same line that you've been bought into by the blood of Christ. And he says right here, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for God is a consuming fire. I'm the temple. Supposed to be a revealer of God's glory. Things that aren't of God in my life and everything around me will be consumed by God. Things are being shaken that are going to be removed. The institution of religion, they're getting it on the chin right now in a big way. Listen, the number one group of people who claim to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ takes a scripture out of tune, and I don't think this guy's even a, I don't think he's even in the lineage of Peter. But for the longest time, if you're going to be the head duck over this group, you had to come out of the line of Peter because the Bible said that, Peter, you be my rock, and on you I'm going to build your church. Is that not correct? Yeah, well, that same guy that's supposed to be the head, you know, when, when you're in New York City and the news comes on and they talk about the church, they're not talking about you. They're talking about the Grand Poobah and all of them under it. Now, now, the number one proponent for a one-world religion, he's taking the ball from Rick Warren out in California with his chrysalis business, and he's running with it to the goal line. How many of y'all read in the news? The nominations now have been caught with child trafficking and different things. There's a lot going on out there. It's all getting shook up and turned upside down. Just pay attention a little bit. It's gone beyond the fact. I mean, the, the part about... Having homosexual preachers didn't even bother us enough to even get upset. The institution of religion is so numb to reality that they didn't even celebrate when Roe versus Wade got turned over to states' rights. When the Johnson Amendment of 1954 got taken off the books in 2018, nobody said anything. 2016, nobody said anything. No, we're just doing our little thing. And what's left in the dark, keep it in the dark so it doesn't come out in the light, so our house doesn't crumble, so that we don't get turned upside down. Let me tell you today, my God is a consuming fire. And if I'm dependent on the institutions, then I've lost dependency on God. 
if I'm dependent on the institutions, then there's a good chance I've got holes in my purse. If I'm dependent on the institution, there's a real good chance that I got blinders over my eyes. There's a real good chance that I got cotton in my ears and I can't hear. If that be so, get ready to be upside down. If you're upside down, get ready to be consumed. I'm not going to preach, get ready to get out of here. I'm telling you right now, you better live not to be shaken. To walk by faith and not by fear. To walk in obedience to the voice of God. To dwell in a kingdom that stands upright. While everything else is being shaken. To live open handed. Not as you're begging from God. But that you live generously because you're not afraid. You're not afraid of doing without. You're not afraid of being obedient to God. Invest with a purpose. Sow true seed expect a harvest and we're fine does anybody believe that tonight or you think I'm just nuts do you think there should be a glory in the latter temple do you think there should be recognizable glory that's what we're praying over Murphs when they get up there to the swamp that they walk in the darkness and the glory of God just go you know just walk down the street looking like Murph and everybody goes the last time you walked in somewhere and somebody just went, ah! what's the matter with you? I don't know why. My pants unzipped. No, there's just something weird about you. Yeah, it's called the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. That's it. How'd that happen? Faith. Faith in the kingdom of God and the King of Kings. That's all I got tonight. Anybody else got anything? Anything you want to add to, take away from, talk talk about? Spit it out while we're here. We're just at the family kitchen table. Huh? We're doing good? We okay? Went over to Dusty's Bible study the last two weeks. They wanted to hear about the seven institutions. Institution of education, institution of religion, institution of finance, institution of media, institution of entertainment, uh, the institution of family. There's seven of them. What was the first one to go? Family. If you're going to destroy a nation under God, get rid of the family. See, it's the first place you sow from a man to a woman generationally. It's the first harvest. First seed, first harvest from the church of the firstborn. Get rid of the family. Once you split them up, you can educate them. You can institutionalize them. Now we'll trap them with their finances. Yeah, not in the kingdom. Institution's not for us. God is for us. So, all right, let's pray. We'll get out of here. If you need special prayer tonight, come down and see me. Be glad to pray with you. Lord, right now tonight, I want to lift up a young man to you, uh, Brady Martin. Lord, he's a little 10-year-old. I know he's no secret to you. I know you've heard about him. I know you know him, and I know that people are praying for him. And right now tonight, Lord, I pray for that young man and I rebuke leukemia in his body. We stand with him and his family now that he would live a complete, whole, and well life. We sow the word of God into him right now through our voice that you said that by your stripes we are healed. You said the word of God would bring healing, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would promote healing, that our bodies were designed to be healed and well. So we rebuke all types of cancer, disease, leukemia of the blood. We rebuke it in in the name of Jesus and pray for this Brady Martin, Lord, that he be well and he be whole. We pray for all others tonight, Lord, who are dealing with situations, whether it be health, family, finances, whatever, that our dependency be focused on you and not on the institutions. That, God, we realize that we can walk one-on-one -on -one with you, that we can hear your voice, obey your word, and you will lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. You'll lead us beside the quiet waters. You'll lay us down in the green pasture. Lord, we know that we're in a kingdom that cannot, will not, never be shaken. But that, Lord, everything around us is being turned upside down. 
Lord, we recognize that. We do not rejoice in the shaking, but we rejoice in the reconciliation that came by your grace and your mercy, by your death and resurrection. Lord, let your church reveal your glory outside. Let us live to your glory. Not gather to your glory. Live to your glory. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen.